Welcome, guys. Uh, today's screencast will focus on the structure of the atmosphere. You know, so far we've already looked at so many human impacts. Uh, we looked at human impacts to our lithosphere, whether that is through accelerated erosion and loss of topsoil or through the destructive forces of surface and subsurface mining. Uh, we've also looked at impacts to our hydrosphere. Uh, and so today we're going to actually start to look at what we're doing to our atmosphere, right? Which is, of course, that sort of thin gaseous envelope that surrounds the Earth, and it's bound to the Earth based on Earth's gravity. Um, when we look at the structural components in the anatomy, um, it's actually, well, we come back to lasagna here, right? It's stratified again. So there are distinctive layers. Um, going from Earth's surface to outer space, it begins with the troposphere, and then we enter the stratosphere, mesosphere, thermosphere, and then actually finally, technically, there is one more layer here called the exosphere, which is a layer that is sort of diffuse, that sort of spreads out into empty space. Um, our focus for this class, while there are many layers of the atmosphere, many structural components, we are mostly going to focus our attention on the innermost layers, which includes the troposphere, and it also includes the stratosphere. Right? And so this is where the major focus of this course will reside. Um, I think it's going to be really important because obviously we're going to be getting into some major atmospheric phenomena and you know certain contentious environmental issues such as climate change and ozone depletion. You know, before we get into that, um, I want to make something clear. When we talk about global climate change, right, we're talking about things that happen in the troposphere. So this is where the greenhouse effect occurs, and this is where those greenhouse gases are accumulating and raising global temperatures. Okay. Now, when we talk about ozone depletion, we're talking about the stratosphere. And what's important to note is that these two atmospheric phenomena are happening in two very different layers of the atmosphere. And as a result, they are actually separate issues. And I know the popular press is constantly botching that, right? They often use ozone depletion interchangeably with global climate change and global warming. Uh, and in fact, they really don't have much to do with each other at all. You know, a loss in ozone doesn't necessarily mean that we'll experience a warmer world, right? And a warmer world doesn't necessarily mean that we're going to lose more ozone. So they are separate issues, and, and there are some sort of in intricacies that tie them together. But for the purpose of this course, we need to treat them as separate issues. All right, so when we talk about climate change, global warming, we're referring to the troposphere, and when we're talking about ozone depletion, we're talking about stratospheric ozone depletion happening in the stratosphere. Okay. All right, so why do we have these distinctive layers of our atmosphere? Um, I think the, you know, the underlying reason, I suppose, is or are changes in temperature. All right. So every time the temperature changes, as in whether it's increasing or decreasing, it creates sort of a new atmospheric layer. All right. So for example, if we're talking about the troposphere, this is of course where we live, right? And if we're starting at Earth's surface, uh, you'll notice that the temperature, average temperatures in our troposphere are right around 15 degrees. Well, clearly, as you increase in elevation, temperatures are decreasing. Well, that makes sense because we know as we get higher and higher, there's a reduction of atmospheric pressure, right? Because the higher you go, the less air or the less atmosphere is above you. In fact, the greatest atmospheric pressure is found in the troposphere. It's where there's the greatest density of air molecules because the atmosphere is bound to Earth's surface.
because of gravity. And so all the, or ma the majority, about 75 to 80% of the atmospheric mass is found in the troposphere because that's where the heavier molecules sit close to Earth's surface. And so the higher we go, there's less air molecules above us and pressure decreases. And since pressure is decreasing as we increase in the troposphere, temperatures will get colder and colder because that reduction in atmospheric pressure creates sort of an expansion of air molecules that causes the air to cool. So by the time we get to the top of the troposphere, temperatures are below negative 40 degrees. And notice the temperature pauses, right? So we were in the troposphere, temperatures decreasing, then the temperature stops getting colder at the tropopause, that's a boundary or interface, and then once we enter into a new layer, temperatures increase, and then we enter the stratosphere. All right, so whenever you see these temperature changes, a new layer emerges. And since temperature stops getting colder at roughly about an elevation of 11 miles, uh, then we start to increase temperature as we enter into the stratosphere, which extends from about 11 miles to 30 miles in altitude. And so once we enter the stratosphere, temperatures increase. And that's, of course, pretty interesting. And why are temperatures increasing here? Uh, well, one could argue that it is increasing because there's a higher concentration of ozone gas in the stratosphere. And ozone is very capable of absorbing ultraviolet radiation. Uh, and that's very important because it serves as a sunscreen. But since it's absorbing ultraviolet, the temperatures in the stratosphere begin to increase. Well, they'll pause once again when they get to the stratopause. And then as we enter the mesosphere, notice temperatures decrease until we get uh, roughly about 85 kilometers in elevation. They pause once more. And then as we head out to space, we can see temperatures spike and they increase as we move to space. And I think it's important to note that Really, you know, if you put your hand out in this area in the thermosphere, it wouldn't necess necessarily feel hot to the touch. But rather, since there's so few air molecules here, and those air molecules become very excited because of cosmic radiation and solar winds and so forth, they get excited and increase the kinetic energy. So the average kinetic energy or the temperature of the thermosphere increases dramatically as you head out into space. Some other uh, interesting features is to note that the only layer of the atmosphere that contains water vapor is the troposphere. This is, of course, the layer that we live in, and therefore this is the only layer where weather occurs. Okay, so let's move on. I want to focus right now on the stratosphere because um, we know the stratosphere contains ozone. And there's actually good ozone and there's bad ozone. So at the top of uh, page two, it asks you to write out a rhyme scheme, right? And that rhyme scheme I would like you to write is ozone is good up high, but it's bad nearby. So we want ozone up high, specifically in the stratosphere and we don't want it nearby in the troposphere. All right, so let's first talk about this good ozone that exists between 11 miles and 30 miles within the stratosphere. This is the good stuff, and of course, we didn't get this stuff until, of course, the atmosphere composition changed with all of that cyanobacteria in the oceans millions and millions of years ago, and that cyanobacteria sequestered carbon dioxide and underwent photosynthesis to release oxygen, right? And then those oxygen molecules started to build up in concentration in our atmosphere. Now, until then, life wasn't really possible on land because if you lived on land, you would have been burnt to a crisp. Um, lots of ultraviolet radiation coming from the sun was burning the surface of the earth and it wouldn't really be possible to live there. Well, all of a sudden, once this oxygen started to accumulate in the atmosphere, 
those UV rays started to photo disassociate it. And you can see here you have a molecule of oxygen, two oxygen atoms, which are ultimately being split apart through a process we call photo disassociation into two free radicals of oxygen. So those free radicals of oxygen are now free to mingle. And mingle they do, right? So we have the free radical interacting with other molecules of oxygen. And when they combine, they form O3. And O3 is, of course, ozone. And so over time in the stratosphere, a lot of ozone accumulated. And, and so this became known as our ozone layer, which is really just a concentration of ozone gas found in the stratosphere. And why that's important is because that stratospheric ozone blocks out up to 95% of the incoming harmful UV radiation. Right? This is high intensity energy that is capable of causing sunburns, right? And worse than that, of course, skin cancer, melanoma, uh, causes cataracts. It can suppress one's immune system. So there are lots of health consequences to allowing more stratospheric ozone. But because we had the ozone layer, life was able to colonize land, and we weren't at risk of being burnt by those harmful UV rays. So of course, here's the problem, right? So since we know that UV radiation uh, was being blocked by ozone, we're starting to notice that more and more UV radiation is capable of passing through the stratosphere over the last 20, 30, and 40 years. And the reason for that is, is that humans have developed certain chemicals. And these were sort of wonder chemicals that were non-reactive, they were odorless, they're not combustible, and they were, had all sorts of amazing uses, right? CFCs are the major class, including halocarbons and halons as well. And these chemicals were used in things such as refrigerants, aerosols, air conditioners, uh, styrofoam, plastic foams, and then the halocarbons and halons were used in fire extinguishers. Well, they didn't think there was any problem with these chemicals, but what, what they didn't realize is that while maybe stable in the troposphere, if they migrated to the stratosphere, they start to, when undergoing photochemical reactions, they start to break down that good ozone. 90% right? of our ozone is in the stratosphere, and that concentrate concentration started to decline with the increase in these chemicals. Well, now all of a sudden, more UV light is passing through the atmosphere. There's been higher rates of skin cancer, higher rates of cataracts. The base of the food chain in the oceans is being undermined because that UV radiation kills phytoplankton in the ocean. Um, and so that's sort of sending cascading effects through the food webs of our marine ecosystems. So this is, what, what, this is what's happening. So the good stuff is declining. The good stuff that we want up high is depleting. Well, while the good stuff is depleting, the bad stuff is actually increasing. Because while we want ozone in the stratosphere, we don't want it where we live in the troposphere. This is called bad ozone, and this accounts for about 10% of the ozone in our atmosphere. Bad ozone is a product of photochemical reactions, uh, especially in warm, dry, sunny climates like Los Angeles, where there are high population densities, uh, photochemical reactions produce smog. And one product of smog is ozone. And so how does this actually form? I'll come right back to this slide. Um, photochemical smog is, again, a photochemical reaction where you have VOCs, which stands for volatile organic compounds, these are naturally occurring compounds. They are hydrocarbons. Uh, methane would be one example of a hydrocarbon. And about one third of the VOCs in our atmosphere are naturally occurring. However, they're also given off from the combustion of fossil fuels, right? Natural gas, as well as from our automobiles. So during rush hour, VOCs are being released into the atmosphere. But that's not it. 
because VOCs in a fairly complex reaction react with nitrogen oxides. And nitrogen oxides include both nitrogen or nitric oxide, NO, as well as nitrogen dioxide. So when you burn gasoline, for example, nitrogen oxide is given off. And then when that nitrogen oxide gets into the atmosphere and reacts with more oxygen and becomes oxidized, it produces nitrogen dioxide. And this is what gives sort of the atmosphere a brownish haze to it from the nitrogen dioxide, which is a, uh, a gas that is, um, can really irritate one's respiratory system. So when these VOCs react with nitrogen dioxide in conjunction with sunlight and heat, they release photochemical oxidants. And these are the byproducts of these photochemical reactions that not only affect our health, but they also affect the environment. And some of these photochemical oxidants include, well, ozone, right? Also, aldehydes and PANs or peroxical nitrates. And these are all secondary pollutants that are the result of photochemical reactions occurring in our atmosphere that have profound consequences. And, and some of those consequences include a reduction in visibility, so those nitrogen oxides, which can then also react with water vapor to produce nitric acid, reduces visibility from this photochemical brown smog. All right, those photochemical oxidants also have a tendency to destroy vegetation. And then moreover, since they oxidize in our atmosphere, they also oxidize in our lungs and become very irritating. And oftentimes they exacerbate respiratory health issues. And they can lead to things like chronic asthma and chronic bronchitis. Also sort of exacerbating heart disease and so forth. So there's a lot of health and ecological consequences from this bad ozone. And here's the kicker of it all. So while we're reducing the good ozone in the stratosphere, what that's doing, it's allowing more ultraviolet light to penetrate and get into the troposphere, which then stimulates the production of the bad ozone in the troposphere. So it's good up high, it's bad nearby. Unfortunately, we're reducing the amount up high and we're increasing the bad stuff nearby. All right, that's it for now, guys. Uh, you are going to use this chart, which is found on page one, to examine the atmosphere structure and answer the questions found on page thirteen. All right, guys, have fun.